Music therapy is a treatment modality that uses music to help clients reach non-musical goals. Luis was really paralyzed before, almost completely paralyzed. Luis couldn't move his arms. Your body is, <laughs> your body is really moving very well. The Healing Arts umbrella at NICO is it's excellent because of our partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts. NICO, which stands for the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, it began as a four-week intensive outpatient program for active duty service members with traumatic brain injury and underlying psychological health conditions. Many of the service members coming through have a very difficult time verbalizing what they've been through. And this is due to an actual physiological change that occurs in the brain after either a traumatic brain injury or a traumatic moment in general that, that results in uh, PTSD. And the art therapy gives them a mechanism to visually show it, so it gives them a visual voice. We've had over 1,000 masks created and conducted a thematic analysis on almost 400. And the masks themselves are inching us closer to these service members and what it is they're most focused on. And it will help providers know where they should head in, in their treatment. One of the things that we grapple with here is these service members do respond so positively to the art therapy. And that's one of the main goals of the partnership is to help replicate and expand into areas where service members can then have access to, to these creative arts therapies within the community. While I'm here, it's one of the days I calm down. My brain stops working on all the other things that it thinks about, and I get to have fun. It's something we started about five years ago, offering art to recovering vets. This is actually as much therapy for me as it is for them, I think, probably sometimes more so. I had met soldiers in here that they couldn't speak to you. What was their challenges? But they were able to paint it and draw it for you. Through art and music, we're healing. We are healing. And I said we because most of the time when the soldier come, the family, we're here with them. And we all heal together. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light? It's truly really a miracle. I think without what all our team have done for Luis, this couldn't have in my family the quality of life we have. Um, we don't even think we're disabled anymore. You can go anywhere, and uh, we don't see the disability, we only see the possibility. And the streaming, and the rockets right there, the bombs Welcome to Music and Mind Live. I'm Renee Fleming, and today we have an esteemed panel of guests, all of whom are involved in supporting our veterans. I'll begin with Bob Woodruff, the illustrious ABC News correspondent who back in 2006 was seriously injured by a roadside bomb while covering the conflict in Iraq. Just 13 months later, he was back on the air. And since 2015, he's been ABC's primary correspondent in Asia, traveling to North Korea eight times and he co-wrote with his wife, Lee, a best-selling memoir chronicling how their family persevered through his injuries and recovery. In addition to receiving multiple Emmy and Peabody Awards, he's also established the Bob Woodruff Foundation to raise money to assist injured service members, veterans, and their families. They recently announced 2.1 million in expedited grants to support the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. As a performer, of course, I know 
the National Endowment for the Arts. But it wasn't until I partnered with them on Sound Health at the Kennedy Center that I began to comprehend the breadth of their work, which seeks to improve the quality of life in communities across the country through the arts. For example, the NEA founded Creative Forces, a military healing arts network that partners with the US Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs. Creative Forces works to improve the health of service members as well as their families and caregivers. In addition to clinical sites around the country, Creative Forces supports arts therapies for service members at NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence at Walter Reed Military Medical Center. Joining us today is Creative Forces Director Bill O'Brien, who is the Senior Advisor for Innovation at the NEA and since 2011 has served as Project Director for Creative Forces, National Endowment for the Arts Military Healing Arts Network. And we're also fortunate to have Dr. Sarah Cass, Creative Forces Senior Military and Medical Advisor. She served 23 years in the Navy, including a final tour as Deputy Commander of NICO. And we welcome Donna Betts, PhD, currently the Creative Forces Clinical Research Advisor. She was previously the president of the American Art Therapy Association. Before we begin, a reminder to submit questions in the comments section there. Last week's episode with Dr. Annie Patel on evolution garnered more than 70,000 views, our best yet. Please share our programs with friends and family because your enthusiasm keeps us going. So welcome to my guests. Beginning with Bob. I, want, I would imagine that the isolation required of patients in our healthcare facilities during the pandemic would be especially hard on recuperating veterans. Can you enlighten us from our, your own experience? You know, my, my story started, I can't believe it's almost 15 years ago when I was traveling through Iraq covering the war. And we wanted to show how the, the power from the US military is being passed over to the the, uh, the Iraqi military, we we're going down this, this road and we were hit by an IED explosion and knocked me out instantly. I was out, you know, I was unconscious for the next 36 days. I was taken out through Bulad into Langstuhl in Germany, then back to Bethesda. And uh, I was living there for the next 36 days without, with just my family around me. And we realized at that time that uh, those other on, others on the third floor of Bethesda Naval we're not necessarily getting the same kind of uh, help when I re when we all return to our our communities. You know the, the kind of you know, medical help was amazing for everybody equally. It just when I went back and got back to the normal civilian life of mine, and those guys went back for uh, other their regular life again back in their own homes, they were not getting really the same kind of help because we are so brand new to these kinds of wars where so many survived, so many were wounded in, in sometimes very invisible ways. So we, but the only good thing that came out of all this is that we're able to start that foundation that you mentioned. So your foundation engages in a wide variety of assistance to veterans and their families. And what types of arts programs is your foundation engaged with? Well, you know, we've now invested about $70 million to help tell veterans and service members and, of course, their, their family members, you know, that have gone through this together. We've now we basically come up with some grants to help these other existing organizations that are doing amazing work. We have funded over 400 of these programs so far. Um, some examples of them, which I think have been incredibly successful so far. The, the Armed Services Arts Partnership, it's also called the uh, ASAP, the ASAP. And it's got classes to to veterans and, and, and you know military family members to try to uh, use some comedy and you know creative writing, improvisation acting, um, you know even some drawing and storytelling in order to get through the kind of PTS that they that they're in need of. Um, we in fact we just funded because of what's going now in the world we funded uh, ASAP to go virtual during COVID nineteen so they just can keep operating themselves. I got so many stories of what, what they've done, you know, as examples of how, how music and comedy can be so helpful, you know, to them to get through these, these times of stress. There's this one sailor that I was told the story that she's uh, named Susan. She had lost all of her hearing in her, in her left ear. And so she felt, you know, suddenly all alone with no one else around her. So they came in and they 
helped her use humor, and now she practices, uh, you know, stand up, stand up humor on stand up you know, comedy shows. Mm -hmm. That's, That's a great. Of, of what's happening, I've got we got several several's under too. You know, the the arts and the armed forces, also, you know, with uh, with Adam Driver. So they and and his wife, so his partner Joanne Tucker. They uh, we've also you know funded them, and they have done things for both civilians and military to to help this conversation between these two very separated groups in our country. It's wonderful that Adam Driver's foundation is also working to, and he's bringing performances to, to veterans and to the armed forces. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. And, and people are able to, you know, uh, do that, uh, engage in this world. To, we all think of it as, uh, you know, the, the actors of, of, of uh, you know, Los Angeles or something. This is, chance for everybody to participate in it. There's also, you know, music is also very powerful for us. Your world, Renee. Yes, <laughs> music yes. Is just, uh, I mean, it's no secret. All of us know that music is helpful. There's M Music Corps, which I think you know about. Arthur Bloom's organization, yes, it's so wonderful. And you've yeah. done some work with them. We've done, we've done with them. And, you know, there's, there's a great story. Um, we had Music Corps up on the stage for our big annual fundraiser for the Bob Woodard Foundation. We have musicians, okay, I can give you the names of all of those too sometime today. But we had a, this great, amazing guy, you know, Tim Donnelly, who's a Marine veteran. He's, he was a triple amputee. After he was so badly wounded as a triple amputee, he just didn't even want to look at music anymore. He didn't want to, I mean, he didn't want to hear any music, he didn't want to do it. And then he got up on the stage and he performed for, you know, 6,000 people. And he said it felt better than anything he'd ever done before in his life. Oh, he, was that's... When he was 20 years old when he was hit in Afghanistan. Oh, oh this gives him a future, gives him so much hope. Um, Sarah, I'm going to come back to you too, Bob. Sarah, you're a family physician by training. Can you tell us about NICO and how you came to be involved and so supportive of music and art therapy? Sure, Renee, thanks. I um, Yes, I had the opportunity to be the director of the NICO as my last um, job in the Navy. And so I was the the officer in charge of the NICO, which is an, a clinical research center for traumatic brain injury and post-traumatic stress. And it was designed in a way that brought all of the services you might need to address the, that injury, that complex injury, into one facility. And embedded into that treatment program were creative arts therapies, at that time an art therapist. And that art therapist is embedded as part of the program, not as something that's just sort of nice to have if you have some extra time and you want to engage in the arts, but it was embedded as a core part of the program that, that helped to shape our understanding of the needs of the patient and then helped to address the injuries and help people to heal. So it was a very innovative program at the time and the arts were very, very important from the very beginning. But I want to understand why or how it came to be that it was discovered that the arts were important. Was it just best practices? Had you been trying it and suddenly you thought this is really getting through, it's really working? You know, I think, I, I'll be honest, I wish I could take credit for being the person who said that this would be really brilliant, we should do this. Um, but smart people before me recognize that. But I think it builds off of what Bob just said about we know music helps us um, emote, feel, understand. We know the arts in general help us to make sense out of things that don't otherwise sometimes make sense. Mm -hmm. And so I think, again, smarter people than myself brought that together and said, this is an important part. And the creative arts therapies have been around for far longer than just our initiative or since the National, and, uh, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence. You know, music therapy was actually born out of World War II when um, music was played for service members who were, who were you know, injured and, and dealing with the traumas back in World War II. And so I, I think what happened was people realized that this was a capability, a service, a discipline that was there that we weren't using as effectively as we could. And so they integrated into this treatment program. And I think that's really how we, how we came to experiment with the value of it. And then I think the work since that time has been about building off of just what our clinical observations are or what our intuitions are and starting to build the evidence. And that's been an important part of the Creative Forces Initiative. Evidence is so important and, and all of the work that you do then can then expand to the rest of the public and be used in, in multiple other 
uh, places, so that's an incredibly helpful. So Bill, you began as a theater and television actor and director. You may all know him from his recurring role on The West Wing. You were also nominated for a Tony for producing the Deaf West production of Big River on Broadway. And now you run Creative Forces. So tell us how the NEA and the Department of Defense collaborate, because I just think this creative, you know, your creative gift married with this work is especially powerful. It, it really is. I mean, it's uh, uh, it's been such an interesting project to be working on, and it really kind of grew out of a, a commitment and an interest in the in leadership at the NEA across uh, the a few administrations that I've been working with and, and for, uh, where there's there's been an ongoing desire to understand what are the benefits and impacts of arts engagement for, for everyone in every kind of different uh, environment. So not just when you're going to the theater or uh, the opera. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, a strong supporter for uh, the value of the arts in those kinds of settings as well. But um, especially the Office of Research and Analysis and this Office of Innovation that, that was set up that I took over um, really became very interested in what the intersections of arts and other sectors would be. Um, creativity in the brain, arts and, and um, uh, developing competencies for the future workforce, those kinds of STEAM, adding arts to STEM, uh, were kind of the early uh, explorations there around 2009, 2010. Arts and health was something that we were really interested in. And um, I heard some grumblings of uh, this really interesting uh, in investigation that was happening up in Bethesda um, being um, advanced by the military uh, to try to respond to this really wicked problem. It, you know, the signature wounds of these wars are, in, are invisible, um, as Bob said earlier. And they really created a, a, a really significant issue that needed to be addressed within military medicine. I grew to be very appreciative in a big, big hurry of people like Captain Cass and the other people at, at the NICO where you know we were hearing they were thinking about how do we respond to this in ways that we haven't figured out yet that may include uh, traditional Western approaches, but they were very open into investigating uh, what um, are often called complementary or integrative types of approaches that would include things like yoga, acupuncture, the arts. Uh, and we were also extremely interested in finding a partner who would be at the front edge of the kind of the tip of the spear of this work, but also interested as we were to understand what is the basic science underneath all of this. So a couple conversations in uh, with the folks up at the NICO, I, I definitely understood very quickly that even though it seems like uh, strange bedfellows in a way, the military and the arts, um, there was such uh, an authentic desire to really respond more uh, impactfully and more effectively to these invisible wounds. And in those early conversations, there was um, a description of how these wounds are often spiritual in nature. They're often um, existential. Um, one of the psychiatrists who was working up there initially, um, Captain Kaufman, uh, you know, mentioned that the arts is kind of built to uh, to confront those um, wicked kind of uh, questions. Um, and I guess, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and do this now. I always look for an opportunity. When I think of this intersection of arts and medicine and all of the different literature reviews we've done to try to understand what the, what the scientific grounding of all of this is, nobody really put their finger on it better for me than Aristotle, who was first a man of medicine, that was his family business. At the time, uh, he also became um, probably one of the most influential drama critics of all time. That's where I first became aware of him. But his notion of catharsis as bringing intellectual clarity from emotional chaos is something you go to the theater to, to experience, but it's also, in this case, something that you would go see Captain Cass uh, to try to you know come to grips with and, and, and create a trajectory through this trauma, come out the other side with a better sense of who I am and what these issues are, improving my ability to communicate about them with my family, with my physician. And then the other thing that we do, uh, that we spend a lot of time now thinking about is, 
what happens when you leave the conversation with your clinician and you go back into your community and then you have people like Adam Driver and uh, the folks at ASAP and, uh, you know, what's their role? Uh, because so much of this is about connection. And I think Bob was sort of talking about that before. One, he came home and he had this, you know, uh, support system. And because of the way military experience is so transitional, you go from being the person who wore your hair that way and dressing this way into being homogenized in a way in, in a military experience. But then at some point you come out on the other side and you get dropped back off into your community. And we have a lot of assets in the community that are really- You need that support, uh, absolutely. Yes, you know, and I think your words uh, also, Aristotle's words are really fabulous for us all right now because this feels like a chaotic time. And I wish we Definitely. could all talk to Dr. Kass and just call her up and say, what do we make of all of this? <laughs> yes, exactly. So uh, thank you so much, Bill. I want to also point out that this innovation, which is such an important word when combined with health and the arts, um, is a title that you created for the NEA. And in fact, it's now become, your department has become the biggest department, Creative Forces. So it's powerful, this work. So Donna, as clinical research advisor to Creative Forces, tell us why research is so important and what some of your findings have been. Thanks so much, Renee. You, you sort of pointed to it earlier when you talked about the need for best practices to be established. And what that means is we need to, we definitely need to have research to back up or support the work that we know that's being done that's so effective. Um, and so this usually begins with program evaluation studies, smaller studies, where you look anecdotally at um, just a few individuals and how the creative arts therapies are benefiting them within the sites across our network. And so um, that has how you sort of begin to establish some of these best practices, or in other words, what is it that music therapists or art therapists or dance movement therapists, for example, is what is it that they are doing it, exactly that is helping the service members and veterans and their families? So the research is a systematic way to implement uh, the science behind um, the beauty of what we do and why it's so powerful. I was glad that we were reminded that music therapy became a board certified field in response to musicians bringing comfort to veterans in both world wars. So I, also the film at the very beginning of this program featured Captain Luis Avila and his wife Claudia. And I had the honor of singing God Bless America with him a few years ago. And he regained his speech through a technique called melodic intonation therapy. This is a music therapy technique, which we learned about a couple of weeks ago in our episode, episode on music therapy. So Sarah, uh, can you explain why treating veterans is far different now than it was in previous military conflicts? Oh, gosh, I you know, I think there's so many things and a lot of it's as I think Bill was alluding to this that a lot of a lot of medical advances come during times of great necessity of war. Um, I would say our amputee care is better than it has ever been, unfortunately, because of IEDs. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is that as we've seen more people survive what would have previously been been catastrophic injuries, they're having to figure out how to, you know, address those traumatic brain injuries and the psychological injuries that come with it. And I think in the past, there's been some stigma about talking about those conditions that is definitely reduced. And I think when you talk to our senior leaders, they, they feel very differently um, now than they probably did in World War II and even in Vietnam. And society feels very differently. People are open to uh, people receiving care for these for these injuries, these invisible injuries. And so I think the willingness to seek care, the willingness to support people engaged in care, and then this openness to novel ways to approach complex injuries that look for any tool in the toolbox. What is out there? What is anything that we could use to help? Because I always think of our senior military leaders like, well, I'm a family physician. So I put everything sort of in the context of the family. And I oftentimes think about the senior military leaders being the, the dads or the moms of the people they send to war and what parent doesn't want whatever will help their child. And I think that's what we see from our senior leaders is whatever will work, let's do it. And I think we receive that support from the DOD and from the VA to explore any option. And with our partnership with the NEA, I think 
the visibility of the effects of these therapies is just so it's so clear and, and it's things like Luis singing with you um, at the Capitol concert and, and the visible impact that the therapies are, are having makes a big, big difference. So um, Donna, I, I had the privilege of touring NICO last year and I was incredibly moved and I did get this message that we are going to try everything that works, that this was a very privileged place also for patients to be. So um, the mask initiative hit me so hard. It's such an immediate aha, immediate understanding of what's being communicated. Um, can you please tell us about this initiative? Absolutely. So uh, this is the mask making technique that is used by many of our art therapists across the network. And of course, this is the work of Melissa Walker, who is our lead art therapist and was the first art therapist in our network. So uh, Melissa developed this, this um, intervention uh, and we, again, use it across the network to, it really helps, as you can imagine, to help the, uh, the participant, the veteran or the service member who's engaging in the mask making to uncover issues related from anything to do with their sense of identity or sense of self, all the way through to help, to help them address and bring forth the traumatic memories and the traumatic material that they experienced in combat, for example. Um, and once that material has been brought to the surface, quite literally, by the work they've done on these masks, it then helps in turn, it helps them to then talk through what happened in a way that verbal, traditional verbal psychotherapy alone may not be able to do quite as effectively. And that's one of the phenomena that we are researching in the network, in our research. I think the word trauma is incredibly important as well because uh, with trauma, sometimes it's very hard to communicate, as you said, uh, and these masks communicate very clearly. Uh, I was incredibly blown away by that. I was also surprised to learn that season generals were participating in modern dance. Can we talk? <laughs> I love this notion. And I said, I can't believe they're willing to do that. And the therapist said, they're in highly trained professionals who do what they are told. That's what the military training is. So of course, they not only do it, they do it really well. Um, can you talk a little bit about just the power, the success of these types of therapies? Uh, any, anyone? Well, I'll jump in and then Bill, if you want to add on, but I mean, I'm, I think it, it makes such good sense because if we think about it, the military music has been a part of all of our traditions forever. And movement as a unit, as a group, is something we're trained on from the very first day we raise our hand and say, you know, I'm in, that moving is something we're very comfortable with in, in formation. And I think that one of the most important things is it always starts with having a therapist who's very, very good at meeting patients where they're at. Liz Freeman, who's our lead dance movement therapist, always starts with challenge by choice. You get to move however much you feel comfortable doing, but that humanistic approach of a therapist, meeting somebody where they're at, helps them to start to be willing to engage in things that maybe they didn't even know they could. But when you get to the very core, most of that trauma is embodied in us. And as we can move, we can start to then let go of that trauma or get through that trauma. And I think much of what our service men and women are working on, Bill alluded to it before, is transitions. How do we transition people from um, healthy to injured and back to well and from on active duty to elsewhere? And that is transition is movement. And as we can use that movement to help people to start to think about their strategies for transition, it is remarkable and it really doesn't matter what your, your rank or your job in the military is, it is impactful and it's great that we have brave senior leaders who are willing to step in and try these things and lead by example. This, this is exactly, if I could just say a couple of things about that. You know, I think one of the most difficult thing about getting back on your feet after something like this completely changes your, your life. You know, something this happens and you're, you're wounded and you're rushed out from the field and you're separated from your team. Your routine is now completely eliminated. And now your career or your life and everything you're good at is now son somehow gone. Yeah. That's the one that is destructive and launches us straight into depression. And it takes so long to finally admit or give in to the fact that you're not going to be the same person you were before. 
So I, I don't, I haven't studied it, but I listen to everything that you're saying here right now, is I think acting, watching programs that you've seen to try to learn music and listen to music and go dance, which you hadn't done before, is one of these ways to do a transition to something new. Yep. You know, you, you don't have to think unendingly about how you great you were before and how bad you are right now. Because yeah. you never did play music. You never did dance. So you <laughs> can't say that, wow, ah, so much worse. I was really yeah. stuck on this. I think about this all the time. This is exactly what it is. It took me forever not to think that I should go back and be the anchor of World News Tonight or something. Or I can't be yeah. the one doing live reporting with a, with a you know, with, a, with memory that was completely healthy. I had to yeah. find that. I think sometimes this gives you a chance to do something new, and then you don't feel like you're in defeat. It, you know, it's hard yeah. to imagine how disorienting it must have been for you when you woke up. And, and I know people have also probably played songs that you knew to try and help you regain your sense of identity and self. Um, so I understand that you made a very interesting friend in that time in, uh, in, in the body of Bruce Springsteen. Uh, <laughs> and my husband is, has got to be his absolute biggest fan. So I'm dying to hear this story. Oh, oh, him. I mean, he was, I was a huge Springsteen fan for, for my whole life, really, growing up. And <clears throat> apparently, while I was asleep, when I was unconscious there in, in Bethesda Naval, my wife and my family come up, and, and Springsteen apparently gave them a whole pile of free albums, you know. And so they came back and played Springsteen music. And apparently, my wife, somewhere in the middle of it all, said, you know, if you wake up, Bob, you know, Springsteen's going to come and visit you. <laughs> And so when I woke up 36 days later, apparently one of the first things I said when I woke up was, hey, is that, uh, you know, ding a ling ding ding that music guy, is he, is he coming? What are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> that, you know, that boss, is he coming? Uh -oh. The boss. Oh my God, he heard me when I said the lied about it. But it's a long story that has a lot to do with a friend of ours. When a friend of ours was at uh, Sony Music and they signed Springsteen for New Deal. and start this whole new fundraising event with, with comedians and hey Springsteen will do it and we went and asked him would you want to go perform with this fundraiser he said absolutely I will and uh, right. he's been 13 out of the last 14 years everything except that one year where he did Springsteen on Broadway that's the only mm -hmm. one so he's been there every every year for Oh, wow. That was a great show. And you know what? You do so much for veterans. You're renowned working with artists like Springsteen, Roger Waters, um, so many terrific performers. I mean, it's extraordinary what you've done uh, to draw attention to all of these things. So we're grateful. We're so grateful for your involvement. Um, I have one more thing. Uh, Sarah and Donna, you were both co-authors of a scientific paper about implementing music therapy through telehealth in military populations with creative forces as, as one of the prime case examples. So Dr. Wendy McGee, who was on our, uh, an earlier program, was also a co-author. Can you just tell us about the impact of COVID-19 on veterans and music therapy? Sure. I'd be glad to jump in. I, um, props to Rebecca Baudre, who really was the one who got that paper published. And uh, Donna and I were proud to be there, but definitely rode her coattails on that. But it, um, and Rebecca was a therapist who was working with Captain Luisa Vila in the film in the beginning. Exactly. Yeah. She's yes. terrific. So we were very fortunate to have partnered with the, uh, with the VA program at the North Florida, South Georgia VA in Gainesville um, on tele-creative -art, tele arts therapies. We were intrigued by what they were doing to, this was back in 2018, what they were doing to deliver creative arts therapies via teletechnology, which seemed, how do you do music like we're doing now, like everybody's doing now, but this was back in 2018. So we started writing this paper back then, but obviously you can imagine COVID has made the need for telehealth so profound. And so it's just great timing that this article is out that talks about how telecreative, how telemusic therapy can work and we were very proud to be able to go from two programs out of our out of the 12 we had at the time two that were able to do telehealth to about nine in a month's time because of the work we did um, on that paper and with our our team down in the va and uh, gainesville so it's been incredibly impactful and we just hope that others can learn from these publications so that they can adapt uh, their practices as well i think overall the creative forces initiative one of our mission elements is capacity building. And our goal is not to 
to do all the work, but to make some discoveries that help other people to be able to do the work uh, in a similar way. And so papers like that make a huge difference. Well, we have a ton of questions from uh, guests who are watching. Um, I want to just ask Bill one other thing, which is, can you tell us uh, what would be your hope for the future of creative forces? Well, I think uh, there's been such a, almost an unexpected resonance um, with the people who've participated from the military side, at least for me walking into it. It's really kind of reframed my sense of who is an artist. I think the answer to that question for me now is everybody. It used to be people who went to school to train. Uh, Bob, when you said, I haven't studied this, but you, you experienced it just like... Uh, uh, anybody who's used these tools to advance their healing. And I think um, what we've really kind of settled in now in terms of what, what the promise might be for the future is to, first of all, understand ourselves and what our, you know, what capacity have we built here? And I think um, with Donna, Sarah, um, and Rebecca and Melissa and some of the other creative arts therapists and clinicians, it's the sense of processing trauma um, and there's a lot of different ways that you can apply that. Um, so if we can really stay the course here and validate what we sense and smell is happening and actually come up with some really valid ways to, um, well, validate it, uh, and then think about how in the future, uh, disaster relief, opioid epidemics, I mean, there's so many different ways where you could use a similar approach in terms of really having a target and thinking about how the arts can be a, um, a lever to try to advance people's ability to, to get through it and to understand themselves. And I love the, what you were saying earlier, Renee, about sense of self. I think that has so much to do with what this is and what the impulse to make art has been for 40,000 years now. <laughs> yeah, who am I, who am I in a context? And the coolest research that we have so far indicates that when the service members who've been through the program are thinking about themselves in a social context, who am I in relationship to my team members, if I'm a Navy SEAL, or in, in, re, in relation to my military service, or in relation to my family, it, it shows that there's positive indicators of health for people who are thinking about that. Um, and what we do with that information and how we move forward is, is going to be the, you know, the mysteries that we're still trying to solve, but it's, uh, I think there's no end to where this could be applied. Well, we're going to uh, go to Bob too and talk about his new show, but at first a few questions. Uh, Anna asks, uh, has there, this is an interesting question actually, has there been research showing individuals from different wars who've had different success with music and art therapy programs? For example, an Iraq war veteran has a greater response or success to music therapy than say a Vietnam veteran? Hmm. That's a great question. Um, I would say that I don't, uh, to my knowledge, there is not research that's that specific. That's, that would be a robust, meaningful research study. Although we are aware of the need to definitely study the individual impacts of each of the wars on each of the individuals, and then also just the differences among kind of cross individuals in general. When we're doing our research. Great question. It is interesting, yeah. Diane from Baton Rouge asks if there are music therapy programs in the field for active duty soldiers, or is it always clinical work when they're back home? Um, I'll take that one. At, at this time, all of our programs are back. Um, they are in military treatment facilities. We do have some, we have a, had a volunteer music therapist actually at Longstuhl Army Medical Center in Germany, um, but they're not forward deployed, but we do have some overseas. Chris from Chico asks, how far back does the history of music therapy to treat wounded veterans go? Well, we know it, it uh, goes back to World War I. Anything else on that? I would just offer, Renee, that um, it, it, that's a great question, it, that the American Music Therapy Association website would be a wonderful resource, and it would include uh, answers to those types of questions, or the individual could contact the American AMTA or you're right exactly yes definitely look that up Chris uh, Rosalva from Tucson asks is there a preferred way to deliver music to patients is there a difference between live music recorded music or enhanced delivery like a biosonic vibrational machine for therapeutic uses 
Well, I, I, I would say that this is why I'm really grateful that we have music therapists in the world because this is exactly what they're trained to do and to understand how to do most effectively. Um, there's definitely a difference between all three of those things and a right time and a right place to use them. And that's the beauty of trained professionals who, who understand the value and impact of all of them. So I think the answer is they're all effective. Just It's personal preference too, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So uh, Bob, um, this is another example of something fantastic that you've done to draw a positive uh, attribute to something that has really been hard. Um, tell us about your new show on Disney Plus, Rogue Trip. Yeah, this is, this is a remarkable chance. I mean, I actually, you know, I've, I've been addicted to traveling forever and I kind of, it was taken away from me for a while and then I recovered and traveled again. Now we got this this brand new COVID one, so I'm trapped again. But right before this happened, we get a chance to do, go out and shoot a story with my son and I going to countries that have a bad reputation for all of the, the war coverage that we've done or you know, catastrophe reporting, starvation reporting. But these countries all have something that's different. They're rogue nations. They're far away or have some controversies. So people don't generally go there. So we get, get a chance to go see these other aspects of these countries and talk to remarkable people. And so this, we went to uh, Colombia, then Ethiopia, Lebanon, Pakistan, Papua New Guinea, and then Ukraine. I actually took my son and my daughter actually both to Chernobyl. So is that responsible as a father or is it not? <laughs> well, I, I, it's been a little while. I, I was touring Germany during Chernobyl and thought, geez, I think there's some ash. I see some ash falling down from the cloud. Um, so no, you, in fact, it was, it was more than responsible. You bonded, you bonded with your son in this trip. We have a clip. So let's show this clip because I am going to be watching this show. Okay. I've covered most of your wars here. I've never been to a place like this. The media who comes here are only interested in the war and the positive side, the world never gets to learn about. That's why we're here. I'm Bob Woodruff. My son Mac and I are on a big and beautiful adventure. I used to be a war correspondent until I got wounded, blown up in Iraq. But I didn't want my kids to grow up fearful because of what happened. I'm Mac Woodruff. My dad has seen the worst in some of the world's most troubled regions. And now, we're hitting the road to seek out the best in them. You have to make it big up to show love. <laughs> I wanted to connect with people in more of a real, authentic way. <laughs> I love doing this right now, but I love doing this with you. My 10-year-old self would probably be pretty jealous of all the time I get to spend with you now. <laughs> oh, great. You know, part so of great. A lot of, the, a lot of those that have gone to war, like the military friends of mine, too, that said you know they always have to, the worst thing ever to happen when you're wounded is the other ones in your team are, are wounded worse than you you know yes. it's, that's the most painful thing and i just had to sort of give my son some comfort that i didn't just go to these these parts of the world to cover just for out of delight you know i just mm -hmm. had to do it but the main thing is i want to show them these countries were not just dangerous places they were ones that in part important part of the world so i wanted to take him back there and don't be afraid about going to these places just because I got blown up. You know, we all need to see that. I think this is going to be beneficial to everyone. Uh, and we, we actually have a, another uh, question that's come in actually from somebody who was in active duty. Lee says, I played in symphony before the service. I'm slowly getting back to the things I love and finding music and art again. Most times the arts are the only way I can express myself. Why does PTSD affect so many modes of communication? And yes, the isolation from quarantine has been very difficult for veterans. Can I say something yeah, real thank quick? Thank you, Lee. Yes. Can I just say something real fast about that? Because I know what we have learned uh, is that because of the COVID thing going on right now, the same, it's someone suffering a lot from our from veterans because they are already entering into depression. And now this isolation is in some ways has a bigger Im impact on those that are already suffering from PTS. Uh, and then also you got older ones are one of the most vulnerable and those from the earlier wars of, of, uh, of Vietnam, for example. So we've seen that and those we're trying to support as man many operations that, you know, the, the, the places that are trying to help them deal with these two problems. Bill, Sarah and Donna, do you have a suggestion? 
I was just going to add, um, I, and I just wanted to acknowledge the, the challenges and to thank um, this individual, Lee, I believe that uh, it, it is a very difficult time and our hearts go out to you. Um, I, and there was a, the question about PTSD and how it affects people. It affects everyone very differently. And as clinicians, we recognize that in our practice um, and, and it can manifest in many different ways, especially if for instance, if there was a, a you know a traumatic bodily injury incurred during combat or a psychological injury, um, if if that individual has a, a history of trauma, for example, as a clinician, when we're treating the trauma, uh, it's our job to help uh, help the individual uncover other traumas that may have come before that trauma that would be complicating the individual's challenges. So that's part of the work we do. Um, so it's really important to seek mental health support when you need it. And right now, as we talked a little earlier about telehealth, uh, right now I know that a lot of individuals are able to find some support with a mental health professional through telehealth or, in other words, online um, through their medical practitioner's uh, referral source, for example. So I would encourage anyone right now who is in need of support to go ahead and, and to try to find that kind of a resource online. Again, there's different ways you can, uh, I would start with uh, you know, your doctor's office or sometimes um, other types of professionals might be able to refer you to someone who can provide health, mental health support at this time. Lee, if you tell us where you are, uh, we'll, we'll try and find something and some other uh, uh, aid. Um, certainly um, various organizations, as you just mentioned, who would wanna be helpful. Um, thank you so much for checking in with us and asking that important question. Uh, so I want to thank our extraordinary guests, Bob Woodruff, Bill O'Brien, Dr. Sarah Cass, and Donna Betts. Please join us again next Tuesday at 5 p.m. via my Facebook page, Renee Fleming Music, or the Kennedy Center YouTube channel. Episodes will be available to view later, though, if you missed the live webinar. And to stay in the loop, sign up for the newsletter at my Facebook page or my website, ReneeFleming.com. Next week, building on our previous conversation in episode three about the musical toolkit for children at home, we'll discuss the effects of music on the developing brain with truly illustrious experts. Author and professor Antonio Damasio is one of the most eminent psychologists of the modern era, and he is the director of the Brain and Creativity Institute at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. An assistant research professor with the same USC program, Dr. Asal Habibi, is the lead investigator for a multi-year study with the LA Philharmonic and their youth orchestra, exploring the effects of childhood music training on brain development and a range of abilities. She also happens to be a classically trained pianist. Dr. Nina Krauss, professor of communication sciences, neurobiology, and otolaryngology at Northwestern University, is a scientist, inventor, and amateur musician who uses hearing as a window into brain health. And Laurel Trainer, professor of psychology, neuroscience, and behavior at McMaster University, has published more than 150 articles on auditory development and perception of music. It is principal flute in the Burlington Symphony. So I can't wait to hear what these amazing innovators have discovered about music and children. So be sure to join us next week. Thank you.